time for my virtual Jericho with John Mayer. Hello, welcome, good afternoon uh, to another My Jericho. This afternoon we're going to be talking about something that you may seem a bit obtuse, Ofcom, the Office of Communications, which actually regulates all the broadcasting and all the telephony in this country. So we're going to talk maybe about three or four points about what's the whole point of Ofcom, and in case you hadn't guessed, that's the title of the book, which is on sale in Amazon. Uh, do we need it? Is it fit for purpose? And uh, will it be up to regulating the, the tech companies, the FANGs? We've got an incredibly distinguished uh, panel this afternoon, mm. if we might see them. We've, we've got uh, Sir Alan Moses, a, a former regulator himself, uh, David Elstein, a, a, a former big cheese in, in the television world, Dorothy Byrne, a just retired big cheese in the television world, and Marcus Ryder, uh, who, who, who is still a big cheese in the television world and has just been uh, made chairman of RADA, of all things. Uh, uh, one of the things we will discuss, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, the possibility that Paul Dacre might become chairman of Ofcom. What's your brief reaction to that? Dorothy. Well, I think you saw my eyebrows shoot up. I think that television regulation works in Britain because the public and broadcasters have a high level of trust, it may not be perfect, in the idea that the regulator themselves are people who are truly impartial. And I think it undermines that confidence and trust in regulation if you put somebody so overtly political in a key role there. So I would not think it was a good idea. David Elstein, you may have a different point of view to that. Look, I, uh, I, I don't know uh, Paul Dacre. Um, I once exchanged letters with him when he was the editor of the Evening Standard and I accused him of running an anti-Semitic article, uh, which he um, demurred at. Um, he's had some pretty horrible uh, things uh, to do to society at uh, the mail, um, but he's a highly intelligent person who also has um, an interesting viewpoint about the role of uh, social media uh, in society. And Ofcom has been slow to get to grips uh, with uh, the overwhelming power of social media. Uh, ironically, um, we are more likely to get some benefit uh, from uh, the European Commission in dealing with Facebook, Google, etc. Uh, so, chairman can't do a lot at uh, Ofcom. Uh, they can't influence much. Um, I'm not sure how good Paul Dacre would be at running a board, and that's a difficult board to run. But you know, I wouldn't say he was in any kind of way a, a danger to democracy or anything like that, uh, if he were appointed. Sir Alan Moses, you were the chairman of, of a regulator, of a regulatory board. How do you feel about Paul Dacre taking over Ofcom? I mean, I think that uh, uh, there was a, indeed an almost more interesting point about uh, trust being engendered by regulation. I mean, if that were true, well then, of course, appointing Paul Dacre as chairman uh, might be sending a certain message as to what the appointers thought that the regulator was for. I mean, I'm just astonished uh, that, that anybody like him would want to, want to do that. I mean, his true love was newspapers and getting people to read newspapers and selling newspapers. I mean, I suspect if you had him on a psychiatrist's couch, he'd say his happiest days were as a young newspaper person at the Daily Express when it was selling four million. I mean, why he wants anything to do with regulation remains a complete mystery. If it's <laughs> true that he does, I mean, it seems a, an absurd thing for him to do. I mean, I think the great, the great secret that, that he did have was this uh, ability to keep, nobody could really tell what he was thinking. He was a, essentially a very private, silent person. And of course, he 
absolutely exuded the ability to uh, make other people fearful and frightened. I think that was a incredibly useful thing to be able to do as an editor. I was always terribly envious of that ability. But uh, um, <laughs> I doubt that that you that him, so did, 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 did he frighten you employ that as a regulator. Sorry? Did he frighten you when you were at Ipso? Oh, absolutely terrified. I mean, I can't tell you. He was, because he had this thing, he never looked at you. He was, partly because I'm very short and he was enormously tall. So he was one of those people who always appeared to be looking over his shoulder immaculately dressed, peering into the distance, and you simply didn't know what he was thinking. A certain, I know, I know, I think he thought I was sort of pretty bogus, really. Um, and, uh, and, and I just don't, th I mean, he regarded regulation of the press as something temporarily useful to stop the noise post Leveson, when I think he had for one moment himself been frightened as to what government would do. And I think he regretted that. He realized that there was an awful lot of puffing and puffing and that government was never going to do anything about licensing, uh, licensing newspapers in the end. And uh, rather regretted that, that he'd ever played a part in setting up Ipsa. But I find it quite uh, uh, astonishing. Marcus Ryder. Well, are you um, looking forward to Paul Baker as chairman of, of, of Ofcom? Not particularly, but I think what the discussion around um, Dacre exposes is that regulation is political. And we need to kind of actually admit that regulation and Ofcom play a political role. And the idea that they don't, whoever is appointed, right, whether, whether it's Paul Dacre, whether it's somebody else, um, it is a political, Ofcom plays a political role because it is actually um, looking at the media industry and the media industry, if it is doing its job properly and if journalists are doing their job properly of holding power to account, is a political um, uh, job that the media does and journalists do, right? And so I think it's interesting that we're talking about um, Paul Dacre as if we've kind of admitted or thought that the previous appointments whether you're from the left, whether you're from the right or, or center, as if the previous appointments weren't political. They were political. I think that we need but, to but sometimes find- who were find... I mean, can anybody, I think that's, your I think start that's of the, the point. 10 named three previous chairman of Ofcom. I think, uh, Alan, I think that's the point. I think the point is, is that we, I could not name them. And I think that is, um, and I think the fact we can't name them, I can't name, a lot of the high court judges. Yes, right? but that, but that. That, yes. Well, no, 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 because it means that we don't, and to think, if you think the high court judges are not political and not actually making political um, judgments and do not come from a certain background, right? We're being very naive, of course they do, right? Paul Dacre puts pay to the lie that it's not a political appointment. Let's leave the, the judiciary alone for a moment and move on. We've got sort of two, two, uh, uh, VTs to play in. First of all, Clive Murray, who is now a multi-award winner, is one of the great broadcast journalists. Uh, in the Harold Evans Memorial Lecture in March, he put the case for Ofcom and for regulation. Let's hear what Clive had to say. I had a paper round at the age of 12, and looking back on those days, I always cite the work of Sir Trevor MacDonald or Alan Wicker as being instrumental in convincing me journalism was my trade. But on reflection, devouring my free copies of the Sunday Times at a young age was influential too. Every week, the uncovering of the truth when encrusted with lies, a belief in decency and honesty. They're all things I recognized in the work of that paper. I, of course, in my very early teens, had no idea who the editor was, but it was Harry. My love of America mirrors his, its endless possibilities. In the 1990s, I was the BBC West Coast correspondent based in Los Angeles, but I frequently made trips to Washington for bureau cover. I will never forget the first time I went inside the White House. I was in awe to be at the heart of global power. 
I later spent quite a lot of time at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue as full-time BBC Washington correspondent while George W. Bush was in residence. I've covered every presidential election since 1996, including Joe Biden's recent victory, and I've reported on many a midterm election in between. The fact that the richest democracy on the planet cannot quite get it right and promote the interests of all its citizens is what's endlessly fascinating about America, the gap between its ideals and reality. Now, these opinion hosts are why people switch on cable TV. The straight news bulletins are by the by. It's the opinion hosts who can mold and shape minds with many millions of viewers every week. They make the money for the networks because their followers are loyal. Add to the mix the fact that TV news providers in America aren't under any legal obligation to be fair and impartial. And you've got gold. Broadcasters in the UK, however, are forced to be fair and impartial in their news coverage in order to hold a license. The rules come under Section 5 of the Regulator Ofcom's codes covering due impartiality, accuracy and opinions. Similar rules did exist in America, but were thrown out more than 30 years ago when Ronald Reagan was president. And attempts since to revive the legislation have always stalled on the altar of the First Amendment, the right to free speech. So in the U.S., you can say what you like within the law. Your opinion is protected and you can use all your power and might to beam that opinion right across the land without giving any counter arguments, without reporting the opposing point of view. Opinion can be dressed up as news. As Americans burned to death, people like this swung into action immediately. They went on television with a partisan talking point. Climate change, they said, caused these fires. They didn't explain how exactly that happened. How did climate change do that? They didn't tell us, but they just kept saying it. In the hands of Democratic politicians, climate change is like systemic racism in the sky. You can't see it, but rest assured it's everywhere and it's deadly. And like systemic racism, it is your fault. The American middle class did it. They caused climate change. They ate too many hamburgers. They drove too many SUVs. They had too many children. Well, there are many in America horrified by the opinion hosts on both the right and the left, whether it be Fox News or MSNBC. Yet a study last year showed that both channels were in the top five of the most trusted news brands for viewers, symbolizing the country's political polarization. It's clear many Americans want their views affirmed, not challenged. But there is absolutely no reason why an independent regulator would materially damage the consumer. I mentioned the study conducted last year that showed Fox News and MSNBC are in the top five most trusted news brands for American viewers. Well, the number three brand is PBS, the public broadcasting service, whose nightly news hour news and current affairs show was deemed in the study by the University of California a few years ago to be the most centrist news program on television and the closest news show to holding a truly objective stance. That's because it has to be fair and balanced, as PBS is technically not a network, but a program distributor that provides television content and related services to its member stations across America, blue states and red states. But what's the brand that beats them all? Fox News, PBS, Bloomberg and MSNBC when it comes to public trust? Yeah. It's the heavily regulated British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, subject to independent rules on impartiality and accuracy, is the most trusted news brand in America. Now, I'm not here to tub thump for the BBC, honest, but the figures are revealing and clearly suggest an ambition to be impartial, watched over by independent regulation, does make a difference for the better in helping to increase levels of public trust. If you haven't watched that, uh, it's a brilliant lecture by Clive. Um, it's available on the My Jericho website. It, it's there forever. So please do. Um, now, uh, talking about regulation, we've actually got a real regulator here today. Sir Alan Moses headed IPSO, the, 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 the press regulator, uh, for five years. He's not applied for this job. Why not, Alan? Well, um... 
I mean, mainly because I didn't think I'd get it. I think uh, uh, when you reach a certain, a certain age and come from a certain background, as was previously mentioned, you, you, become, uh, you become surplus to requirements. And I also didn't think, I mean, I've never, I don't understand what the chair of Ofcom does. I mean, they, we can have arguments about what, um, whether Ofcom's necessary and whether trust of the BBC and of other uh, broadcasters in the UK stems from the fact that they're regulated, which I query. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't think the chair is, is, is important unless it's somebody like Paul Dacre, who's sending, I suppose, um, who, in respect of whom a message is being sent. But otherwise, I don't think they're particularly relevant. I don't know what decisions the chair of Ofcom makes. Did, did you feel you were in charge of Ipso when you were there? Did you feel like a real regulator? Yes, I, I, I really did. I mean, whether <laughs> I, it, 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 of course, poses the question of what a real regulator is. But I mean, I did feel very responsible for really all the decisions that uh, Ipso made for its inadequacies as well as its adequacies. And, and of course, from time to time, it was excruciatingly embarrassing because I deeply disagreed with some of the decisions the committee of which I chaired made. Um, and uh, <laughs> because I chaired the complaints committee. And so the, one of its most important functions was something for which I had responsibility, even though I didn't have the final word. And, and, and much now, uh, you actually don't really believe in regulation, do you? In your chapter in the book, you actually argue against it. No, I just think, well, actually, it's slightly more subtle, I mean, than that, in the sense that I'd like to try, I'd like to have a period without uh, regulation, just to see whether it made a hapeth of difference. I suspect in relation to the BBC and other broadcasters, you simply wouldn't notice. And I really do question the proposition that people trust the BBC because of regulation. I think people, it's got absolutely nothing to do with it. It's the quality of the, it, it, it's, it somehow has an image that uh, of sort of warm beer and sunlit cricket pitches that still applies. I mean, the, the, the sound radio has a pretty tiny audience and yet of course is incredibly influential simply because of the quality of the people who are writing and speaking on it. And I wonder so, whether that's got anything to do with uh, regulation. It may have so, something to do with public service broadcasting and what is somehow in their blood that they feel that the service that they feel they have to provide. But I doubt whether that's to do with because of a fear of Ofcom. So if at the last minute they can't find a candidate, they come to you and they say, Alan, Will you, will you take over Ofcom? You wouldn't accept, and would you then say, no, let's abolish Ofcom and abolish the- No, no, of course I would. No, no, of course I would accept. I would welcome it with open arms. I would love to be chair uh, of Ofcom. I mean, I only said I wouldn't apply because nobody ever suggested and I didn't think I'd get it. But I mean, I can't <laughs> tell you how, how envious I am of Paul Dacre. Why the hell should he get it and not me? <laughs> <laughs> We'll come back to you later, later on, Alan. On, on, on to Dorothy Byrne, who's, who's spent her entire professional life being regulated in, in World in Action, the big story, and then 17 years as head of news and current affairs at Channel 4 Television. She's always been at the edge of, of, of journalism with, with things like World in Action. Dorothy, you're, you're a believer in regulation. Why? I definitely believe in regulation. And, do you know, Alan, I'm afraid the idea that we should just Oops. Keep talking. The worked as a broadcaster nearly all my job. I'm scared of the regulator. I can absolutely tell the head of New Channel 4. Before that, I was at ITV. The regulator really worries us because if we get into trouble with the regulator then uh, i mean to be to be honest if you kept getting into terrible trouble with the regulator 
and being found to be not duly impartial, to be unfair, to be inaccurate, as a television executive, you would lose your job. But I also, I, I have to take issue a bit with Marcus because, yes, Marcus, everything is a political appointment, but it's how political is that appointment? And it, uh, you know, Alan makes a good point when he says you can't name the people who were the chairs of Ofcom because they weren't overtly political people in the way that Paul Dacre is. And again, my experience is that regulation does not stop one making highly controversial programmes. I commissioned three programmes in which we secretly filmed politicians and Ofcom did not find against us for any of those three programmes, even although highly influential politicians made a huge noise about complaining about them. So regulation has worked because it has not prevented us from making very difficult, very controversial political programmes, but at the same time, it, it, it has ensured that when the public feel unhappy about a programme, they've got somewhere they can complain to and, and people will be found against if they are unfair. What's the biggest trouble you ever got into with either the IBA or Ofcom? Well, I'm not so... That I have got into trouble, yeah. But but the answer to that question, but we have had findings against us. But I think the key point actually is where they have not found against us. They have not just sided with right wing politicians who we have uh, uh, exposed. And definitely, we know that there are very high levels of trust among the British people. And we know the British people complain to the regulator because look at how many com people complained about Prince Philip. As I understand it, thousands of people complained to the regulator about the fact that EastEnders and their other programmes were taken off uh, all of the BBC because of Prince Philip's death. And we get a lot of complaints to Ofcom it's, it's not a moribund organisation. The British people know it is there and they use it. Which did you feel was the most unfair judgment against you? Gosh, no. Well, you're asking me to emphasise my bad points. Um, I... There were some fair judgments against us. I, I, I don't... I, I, I don't sit and feel that the regulator has acted badly, and I don't feel that it's been a heavy-handed regulator. Okay, and that's we'll, vital we'll, in a democracy. We'll, we'll come back to you a bit later on, Dorothy. Marcus Ryder, you, you've had a, a life in television which has been uh, regulated. At, at BBC, you had the current affairs, BBC Scotland. Uh, making some rather edgy programs, uh, and now you're chair of RADA. Um, now you actually think that uh, Ofcom has a different function in television in terms of diversity and not as you would expect it. Over to you. Well, I think we can talk about um, Ofcom regulating complaints, but the other important role that they have is deciding how broadcasters meet their license requirements. Um, and or, their, or for, now it's taken over the BBC, you know, it's charter requirements you know so Ofcom is the body that decides um, uh, you know when there is a license requirement for um, news and current affairs at, at prime time when how many hours that should be Ofcom is the one who um, talks to the broadcasters and they come to an agreement with all sorts of different things with regards to children's television and other genres and so if you're ooh, sorry it looks like my my thing has stopped, but I'll keep talking. Keep um, talking. Okay, fine. Um, but the other um, thing is, 
Ofcom, ever since diversity has explicitly been put into the charter, um, which is I think in 2015, no, 2016, I think, um, into the BBC charter, Ofcom has a, has a duty to decide how the BBC actually meets that charter requirement. And Ofcom, I would say, has not actually made it explicitly clear how the BBC should actually meet that charter requirement um, and what that actually means which is strange because it actually is quite explicit as to how the BBC should meet its other charter requirements with regards to other genres or with regards to workforce um, when it comes to out of London productions and what have you. And so I think that for diversity, um, Ofcom has been, has for some reason, and I don't know why, but for some reason has not actually um, uh, regulated in the same way that it's regulated either workforce, um, which it's done previously with, or currently does, or with genre when it comes to diversity. Now in your chapter, you actually have an interesting position about something called monopsony. And now those, people, those of us who didn't go to the LSE, perhaps you'd like to explain what that means and what it means in television and how Ofcom should tackle it. Broadcasting is an oligopsony, which is when you have a few buyers and multiple sellers. Um, so what you have with UK broadcasting is a few broadcasters, so a few buyers of the product, and you have multiple um, sellers, you know, in, independent productions, independent producers, and what have you. And uh, that's the point of a regulator. That's the point of off what, that's the point of a regulator. When you have a monopoly, when you have a monopsony, when you have an oligopoly, when you have an oligopsony, you have a regulator because they are prone to market failures. And it would appear to me, and I would put the argument, I put the argument forward in, in my essay, that part of the market failure or part of the reason for a lack of diversity is because we are in a market failure of an oligopsony. And Ofcom's job, and any regulator's job is to regulate oligopsonies because they are prone to market failures. Should, should they be more interventionist? Should they be, be more like the Competition Markets Authority than they are at the moment? They should be exact, when it comes to diversity, they should be exactly how they are with regards to regional diversity. They came up with the definition of what is regional diversity, what is, what is an out of London production. The BBC um, recently published off its own back what a uh, diverse production is. And uh, they would, the BBC, nor Channel 4, nor any other broadcaster would be allowed to come up with its own definition of what an out of London production is, right? It was Ofcom and it's Ofcom's definition, which everybody uses, right? And so it just seems a bit strange that Ofcom realizes that um, defining some of these things is so important. And yet when it comes to diversity, Ofcom seems to have taken a more laissez-faire approach um, in deciding how to define things. So how would you compensate for market failure in the television industry? I would compensate for it. Ofcom does a brilliant job. Uh, so it's, it's a market failure. Um, news and current affairs, Let's, Dorothy would not have a job if there wasn't regulation, or Dorothy wouldn't have had a job if it wasn't for regulation. Right, because Ofcom stipulates how, how much current affairs and how much news that prime time mm. there should be. So there, is a market, so there is a market failure in that. And Ofcom steps in and works with um, Channel 4 and works with the other broadcasters to, make, to address that market failure. Same with other genres. And so when it comes to diversity, if there is a lack of diversity, right, which most people seem to think there is, Right? It's Ofcom to step in in exactly the same way. So I'm not asking Ofcom to do a different job than it does to any other genre or any other aspect with regards to out of London productions. It already does the job and it, and it does it really well. I mean, there are flaws and we can criticise it, but generally speaking, it does it really well. So all I'm saying is that when it comes to diversity, Ofcom should do exactly for diversity as it does for other genres and other um, market failures. You're one of the leading campaigners for more diversity in British broadcasting. Um, have Ofcom consulted you? Do they, do they come and say, Marcus, what about this? What about that? Um, I speak to, to members of Ofcom and I've gone in and spoken to um, members, high level members of, of Ofcom. 
Um, I don't know how seriously they, they take what I say. All, all I do know is that they have not stepped in and given a definition of a diverse production. They've let the BBC define that themselves. They have not set um, any targets for any broadcasters at all. So they may talk to me, so they do talk to me sometimes, um, sometimes off the record, some occasionally on the record. But what I do know is that they haven't stepped in and regulated broadcasters in, um, for, when it comes to diversity in the same way that it's regulated other aspects and other market failures in the broadcasting industry. Uh, how diverse are they themselves? Thank you, my question. Just, how diverse is the Ofcom staff, Marcus, the 800 people? I'm not sure how diverse the um, 800 people is. I know that um, up until recently, its boards were um, not very racially diverse. There was more gender diversity. Um, they did have a, and so what I would say is that you should then, I would then go to DCMS because it's an act of parliament which sets up its different boards. And so for example, um, they briefly had a board which looked at disability, but it wasn't statutory. Um, and so that eventually got um, folded into another board, you know. So the boards, so it has all the, all the, nation, all the nation's boards. So it's got um, Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, and England. And what I would argue is that if you look at ethnicity, for, exa for example, um, I don't know which term we should be using, um, but non-white people make up roughly the same population size, slightly smaller than uh, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland put together. Right? And so if we think that there should be an audience board which is representing those particular interests and see that they have a particular interest that need to be um, represented in Ofcom, I would argue that there should be at least a, one board which looks at um, diversity. Would you like them to do a head count in terms of their own diversity and, and report that publicly? I think they do. I think, that, I think they do do that. I don't have those figures to hand, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that they do do that. I think the, the issue, um, as always, is whether we look at head count diversity or what I will, I'm increasingly arguing for is looking at salary spend diversity. And salary spend, salary is often uh, an indicator of power in an organization. And so if you look at salary spend diversity, what proportion of your salary is spent on different groups of people, that is often a better indicator as to where power lies in an organization as opposed to doing a simple headcount diversity. And also, if you look at the BBC, for example, you could do headcount diversity, but I know the BBC better. And so I know which areas um, women might be in or people or disabled people might be in or people from ethnic minorities might be in. And on the face of it, it might look like um, some of the diversity numbers are good. But if you know an organization well enough, you will know where the different um, levers of power are. And so you will know who's wielding those. Um, and you'll know where the critical mass is. Because also it's important to recognize that it can't just be one individual. You need, to, if you're gonna actually have cultural change when it comes to gender, when it comes to regionality, when it comes to any aspect, it needs to have a critical mass to afford, to have critical, um, to, actually have, to actually achieve cultural change as well, to change the culture of an organization. Now, um, today is the day that uh, the Facebook Oversight Board actually approved the ban on Facebook on Donald Trump. So now is a good time to go to one of the huge figures in world media, Mark Thompson, who was a very, very distinguished BBC Director General for eight years. And he just left the New York Times after another eight years as a CEO. In the Philip Geddes lecture in Oxford in March, he tackled the regulation question. Let's see what he said. Is it really acceptable that half a dozen companies, perhaps in the end half a dozen individuals, should wield so much influence over, if not the totality of content available on the internet, then that portion which most people consume most of the time. What protections are there against the purely arbitrary exercise of this great power? The winner-take-most character of algorithmic digital services 
and the incredible success a handful of companies have had in engaging and monetizing vast audiences poses questions about competition and markets that regulators are now taking seriously in many jurisdictions. But the same mass engagement has also had the effect of concentrating power over content distribution. In the 20th century, policymakers confronted exactly this problem in broadcasting. Spectrum was scarce and the radio stations and TV channels necessarily few and so disproportionately influential. As a result, governments everywhere, even the United States, put in regimes of content regulation that would have been unthinkable for newspapers and magazines. Now, one can hear many politicians on both sides of the Atlantic itching to do something similar in the case of the major digital platforms. I'm against it, or at least against it, unless it turns out to be the only workable solution. Governments themselves have enormous conflicts of interest when it comes to content regulation. And even, even if you happen to trust the government in power in your country now, what guarantee do you have that the next one will be able to resist using the levers of regulation to suit itself? The internet left the Garden of Eden a long time ago now. The web magnifies and accelerates everything, the bad as well as the good. And it turns out not just that human nature doesn't change as rapidly as technology, but it doesn't that it doesn't change much at all. QAnon and other similar dark products of the human id adapt and mutate. They ebb and they flow, but they don't go away. Like background viruses, we're probably going to be living, living with them forever. But no publisher or platform on earth has any legal or moral obligation to spread them or indeed to distribute any form of prejudice or hate. So eject them from your platform if you can, and yes, ban their authors for life. There will be hard cases, for instance, when racist conspiracies get tangled up with electoral politics and the lines are hard to draw. But at least to me, this January proved that not just venerable news organizations, but relatively young digital companies can figure out a way through. But those companies will only remain free from heavy regulatory control if they move quickly to establish secure checks and balances to ensure that the unprecedented power they have over what the world sees and hears cannot be abused. And all of this is urgent. The world moves a lot faster now than it did in 13th century England. We won't get 700 years to put up a plaque to say, we're sorry we got it wrong. We may not even get seven. If you want to hear, read more of Mark Thompson, and indeed most of the contributors today, and, and another 14 or 15 stellar contributors, do buy the book. It's called What's the Point of Ofcom? Is, broad, is the broadcast regulation still fit for purpose? It's there on Amazon and Kindle and paperback, uh, and, and it's there forever. Let's move on, if we can, to one of the, uh, the grand old men of British broadcasting, uh, a description I'm, I'm sure he, he won't like, uh, David Elstein. Director of Broadcasting for Thames TV, then Sky, and then you set up Ch Channel 5 and was the founding CEO. David, um, is it fit for purpose, Ofcom? Well, the first thing I should say is, uh, just in case anyone watching this thinks we are um, <coughs> uh, swimming in ignorance, I I've known all four uh, chairs uh, of Ofcom so far, uh, David Curry. Uh, Patricia Collett-Bow, Patricia Hodgson and, and uh, Lord Burns. I don't know the acting chair uh, currently serving for a few months, Maggie Carver, waiting for the new appointment. But um, uh, they were all uh, good at their job, which was uh, doing what Ofcom was set up to do. Unfortunately, uh, Ofcom's uh, track record in trying to be a regulator across the board, um, it is uh, limited in its success. On the whole, I think it's been a pretty good content regulator uh, and in some ways better uh, than um, its, some of its predecessors in terms of professionalism <laughs> of um, complaints. Um, when I was a working producer, uh, I lost a number of programs uh, about Northern Ireland uh, to the IBA uh, because uh, the IBA was uh, just 
too unnerved by political pressures to allow uh, certain this week episodes onto the air. Uh, but on the whole, um, I, I share Dorothy's view uh, that uh, the backstop of regulation and the requirement for impartiality are actually good for the broadcasters because they stop certain things getting to air which shouldn't have got to air and they are an excellent defence against uh, attacks on broadcasters from outside interests uh, which um, should not uh, be allowed to prevail. So in that sense uh, you know, um, probably the worst regulator I ever, ever came across was the short-lived Broadcasting Standards Council uh, set up by Mrs. Thatcher um, with uh, Lady Howe as its chair. Uh, and it was a joke in many ways. Uh, so uh, it, my criticism of Ofcom is much more to do with the way it's fulfilled its role as the overseer of public service broadcasting. Now, it's true to say that most of its um, levers and tools were removed by the 2003 Broadcasting Act, uh, which effectively eviscerated all the requirements for um, public service content other than news and current affairs uh, on uh, ITV uh, and Channel 4 uh, and beyond, um, but they have also been responsible for monitoring public service broadcasting ever since 2003. And what they have reported is year on year declines in delivery of virtually all the endangered species of content. So that's uh, regional output, documentaries, religion, arts, children's, um, etc. And uh, it, it's, it should have been uh, part of Ofcom's job to work out how to revive and reinstate public service broadcasting, which is in a sorry state. Unfortunately, it uh, rather gave up the ghost around about 2010. It tried to launch a public service publisher, which wasn't the best thought out idea ever. When that um, uh, was shot down, it, it's never come back with any kind of structural reform ever since. And it has now lapsed into uh, a kind of relativism where, you know, if it's uh, a, a program made in the United Kingdom, that's public service broadcasting. Well, any minute now, uh, the UK so-called public service broadcasters are going to find that they're outspent in terms of first-run UK origination by Sky, Netflix, Amazon, uh, and Disney. Um, the latest thing I've heard from Ofcom is that, you know, any kind of program is public service broadcasting. Shiny Four shows are public service broadcasting. I mean, if they cannot tell the difference between commercial products and public service products, if they don't understand what market failure is, and why we correct for it, uh, then it has failed in its, I think, most important task. And that's the basis of my essay in the book. Uh, very good. What, uh, now you, um, do, do you think they're up to dealing with the tech companies when they, when they take that over? Are, are, are Google and Amazon and so on going to take them to the cleaners? Well, they're... they're it, it, it's really difficult uh, to predict. They've been very careful about taking on, uh, you know, regulation of the internet. Um, this was something that was mooted uh, by Leveson and Ofcom very sensibly ducked and said, no, thank you. Taking on the, the, the not so much the content of the internet, but the gross abuses of power by Google, Facebook, uh, uh, Apple, uh, Microsoft, etc. Uh, you, you know, uh, the notion that the UK, let alone a UK regulator, is going to do much about that is, I think, um, uh, uh, a forlorn hope. 
And, uh, you know, uh, the only argument that ever cut through with me during the Brexit debate about the EU uh, was that at least uh, the EU Competition Commission was willing to take on the US giants and find them hundreds of millions, if not billions of pounds or euros uh, for breaches of competition uh, law. And the EU was big enough to do that. So I don't have any great hopes um, uh, uh, that Ofcom will do much. In terms of child protection, the ability to protect children with suitable filters has been around for a decade. Uh, Ofcom has been fully aware of the mechanisms that uh, were to hand if they wanted uh, to go through with it. But they, like their political masters, were too nervous to do anything. Uh, we have been promised protection of children for year after year after year after year. And where is it? Is it a case of the stable door is trying to be shut and the horse is way down the road? On the, on the no, 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 of course not. No, look. Uh, it could be done tomorrow if you really wanted to. <laughs> if you wanted to impose on all uh, suppliers of video a requirement that they have a filter system uh, which protected children by age, uh, you could do it. Uh, you just pass the necessary legislation. And if anyone doesn't want to comply, then they seek to be uh, visible in the United Kingdom. Uh, look. If China and North Korea can do it, why can't we? If Russia can do it, why can't we? Uh, you know, it, it's shameful that we are uh, so fearful of upsetting uh, teenagers who want to send messages to each other on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram uh, that we can't do something sensible uh, like controlling um, unsuitable material. We manage it in the broadcast arena. Why can't we do it in the non-broadcast arena? Marcus, you had a spell working in China. What lessons would you bring back from that for regulation here, particularly of the tech companies? Well, I'm currently in Malaysia and um, Malaysia is able to regulate and block certain content um, when it comes to pornography. I was also previously in, in Thailand and Thailand very successfully um, is able to get Google to agree to block certain things um, when it comes to um, discussions around their royalty. Uh, it's a political stance that I do not um, uh, agree with personally, but I think that the idea that it's that difficult to regulate um, Google, that you need to be um, somehow in the, in the EU, um, that you need to have a massive um, block would be the size of China to be able to um, impose certain restrictions and regulations on the likes of Google and, and Facebook. I don't think you do. I think- but, the, uh, Marcus, I, I wasn't saying that two different I, things. I, I, the EU is important for regulating co competitive abuse. Co regulating content, any um, sovereignty can do it. Yeah, no, 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 sorry, I, I wasn't, um, sorry, David, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to, um, uh, you know, contradict you or, or, yeah, but I'm just saying that it, it, this can be done. So my experience in, in Asia, I mean, China is extreme, to say the least, and I'm not saying we should go down a China route, but if you look, you can look at other jurisdictions, you know, I've got Australia just, um, you know, a slight hop away. You know, you can see what they've done with regards to Facebook and their attempts to look at, at Facebook. You can look at, as I said, I'm currently in Malaysia. I was in Thailand. And so you don't need to go um, to China to see how you can look at these tech companies. You can look at jurisdictions which are more similar to, to us and are closer to liberal democracies to see how you can so regulate I'm, tech so companies. Smile, you, you sort of ducked out of regulating uh, the, the internet or the, the um, newspaper version of the internet. Would you, would you like to be regulating the, the tech companies? Well, didn't, Ipso didn't duck out of the uh, uh, regulating the internet um, of those newspapers. It did regulate them. And, uh, 
and uh, exercise the same power over, for example, the Mail Online as any other of the newspapers, internet, uh, internet medium. I mean, the problem is the uh, you you can act like China and easily uh, and just ban those that don't comply with the rules. And, but uh, the, the real problem is is finding a balance, is finding a way of uh, licensing uh, that that doesn't um, that doesn't give too much power uh, to those set up to regulate, and and it is and it is a real problem of uh, it seems to me of uh, imposing uh, of identifying a system that has the right sort of sanction. I mean, if you licensed it, you could do it because that's why in one sense, it's so easy to regulate broadcasters because they're simply not allowed to broadcast unless they comply and submit. It becomes much more difficult to do so with international, in international um, media uh, through the, in the, what I call publishers because the use of the word platform is just so much chop logic, but it becomes very difficult to do so unless you have outright bans. I mean, I would just use the criminal law in a much greater uh, way. I mean, I just don't see why you don't, uh, I mean, we, you just need a few directors uh, uh, of these companies appearing in the dock, as it seems to me, for some of the things that they do. Uh, that, well, that well, what sort of charges, Alan? Well, what, they, what could they be charged with? Well, there's a whole mass of things of aiding and abetting. A, a, a trite example is aiding and abetting suicide. I don't know why those companies that were spreading amongst youth means of committing suicide uh, weren't charged with aiding and abetting suicide. I don't know why a, any media company that uh, allowed access to child pornography it isn't charged with a whole raft of offences under the Sexual Offences Act. And, and so that so, there are, I mean, it, it does seem to me that there are, there are means of seeking to control it. What I'm really, the, the problem is, is banning. The, the problem is it, it's so easy to have a blanket ban because we know it can be done in Iran and it can be done in China. But I don't think anybody thinks that uh, the, the disasters of social media are such that they uh, merit ha having outright bans. So you, you would feel a few more collars and put them in the dock in front of people like you, would you? In, to get That's one thing. The other thing is, of course, it depends upon the political... I mean, regulation really works when the regulated understand that it's in their own interest to be regulated. I mean, it's in the public broadcaster's interest, Ofcom is in their interest, for the very reason that, as some of your speakers have said, that it provides, as it were, a defense against, them, uh, against those with special interests trying to complain. That seems to me a very important function. If only you could identify uh, something which suddenly Apple and, uh, uh, and Facebook realized it was in their interests uh, to, to be regulated, that that would really be the key to success. Any imposition of some form of licensing seems to me very, very difficult uh, to impose, uh, having regard to the international, the, the worldwide reach. And an awful lot of, I mean, they're, they're trying to do it in some respects with allowing the possibility of claims and allowing, you to be, allowing them to be sued and creating causes of action. I very much query whether that will work. So the really the, I mean, the awful truth is that it, it needs to be something that uh, realizes that they will lose out uh, unless they agree to some form of regulation. And it's in its identifying how you can impose the, the, how you can, as it were, trigger and rely upon their fears for their own business. It, it seems to me the, the, the key to this. 
uh, and I've got no uh, answer to it. I just, I mean, it's just, one has to remember that the news of the world closed down because uh, nobody wanted to advertise on the news of the world. It ceased to become a, a viable business as a result of the way they behaved. And somehow, uh, the, 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 somebody ought to devise something that would make Apple, Facebook, uh, uh, and the others uh, realize that it's simply not a viable business model to go on behaving as though they're just platforms and don't share responsibility. Dorothy Byrne, you've, you've, you've just left the closeted world of, 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 uh, of TV executives and be, gone into the equally closeted world of being head of house at Cambridge. Uh, well, How actually, you no, it? you're wrong. I'm still making um, television programmes. I've got several commissions, both from broadcasters and streaming companies in America that I'm working on at the moment. And, you know, it is undoubtedly true that companies in America have got a lot more money. And that's why one reason why we uh, need to protect public service broadcasting in the United Kingdom so that we can ensure that the interests of British people continue to be served. I completely agree with David about how dreadful it was that the regulator allowed such a great cut in regional documentaries and current affairs. I think that was a very serious loss to British democracy. Uh, regarding tech companies, uh, we need politicians to put a bit of lead in their pencil and really do something about them. The, this idea that British politicians are all absolutely helpless faced with Mark Zuckerberg. No, they're not. They need to take action, whatever form it is, and some of that will be um, relevant to what regulators should do. But we really need the political will there to take action about these people. I rather like the idea that they should end up in prison. That'll teach them. I mean, very few people deny that action needs to be taken. It's the next stage. What do you actually do? It'd be easy to license Facebook and Amazon tomorrow. You just pass a law saying without, uh, without a license, you're not to have your programs. We won't allow your programs in this country. And part of the license would be to be subject to regulation. But how's that actually going to work? If the programs are being, uh, if the messages are being sent from another country, short of just a complete ban. I mean, you could do it, as, as David said, tomorrow. There are lots of different ways in which you can do it, but you I really you need the, the, you, uh, and each one will have its upsides and its down points, but you need the political will to do it. You know, we saw what happened in Australia. There was political will to take action. We've seen that the European Union is more, uh, is stronger about taking action. We, we need the political will. I don't think we can blame the regulator at this moment for that failure. I find it ludicrous that so many dreadful things are permitted on the internet and politicians just throw their hands up in horror. A last question for you, you run at the end of our hour. Are Oliver Dowden and John Whittendale fit for purpose? David, you're... Oh what, dear. What um, well, <clears throat> what can I say? Uh, every time uh, a Conservative government is elected, um, or even a coalition government, it, it, it comes into office, there are gnashing of teeth and wailing and, you know, shroud waving. The BBC will never survive these ghastly people who are determined to crush it. Uh, Witto, when he became Secretary of State, uh, was seen as some kind of demon incarnate. Uh, I would just call him a complete pussycat. 
uh, Boris, uh, Dominic Cummings. Uh, it, honestly, uh, these are people who are going with the flow. Uh, they've done zero, as uh, Alan and Dorothy uh, have noted, uh, to inhibit uh, the flow of uh, dire content, damaging content uh, that uh, reaches us. Um, however many times they say they're going to do it. So personally, I have very little hope that they will actually do anything effective. And as I say in my uh, essay, uh, in many ways, actually, it's worse for the BBC uh, that uh, this government is just allowing it to drift uh, ever further into irrelevance. Um, it, it, I just wish they would uh, be more constructive and try and persuade the BBC to take its future into its own hands. However, um, you know, I think that ship has sailed. And I've never met Oliver Dalton. I've known John Whittingdale for many years. Um, I've learned to live with the lack of action. Uh, Marcus, uh, the Secretary of State and the Minister of State fit for purpose, as far as you can tell? Um, I've had no dealings with Oliver Dowden. I've had a, a few limited dealings with John Whittendale. Um, going back to the, the Paul Dacre issue, I, I don't think it's right to, um, or useful to personalize these, these debates. I think what's useful is to actually look at the, the structures and actually look at the policies and are they um, uh, implementing policies which are useful or, or not useful. And David has highlighted their lack of action on certain issues. And I would also highlight their lack of action or lack of signaling because it goes direct to Ofcom on some of the diversity issues. So I would want to highlight the actual policies rather than getting into whether Oliver Dowden or John Whittingdale are fit for purpose. Are, are there policies that I would like them to implement that are not being implemented? Yes. Dorothy. You can't ask questions. Sorry, Alan, fit, you to... Yes, I, you can't ask a question about fit for purpose until you identify what purpose. I mean, it, it, it's a ghastly cliche. Why do people go on saying it's not fit for purpose? It's a pointless question unless you start with the proposition, what purpose do you think they ought to serve? That's the first thing. Shall I help you with that? Yes, I Dorothy. think that the chair of Ofcom should be somebody who is widely trusted and respected to maintain the accuracy, fairness, and due impartiality of broadcasting. In terms of politicians, we need them to get a grip on these dreadful tech companies because I expect my politicians to run the country. I don't expect them to say, oh, tech companies are so powerful, I can't do anything about them. Yeah. Well. That's probably a good point for us to end. That's uh, been an interesting hour. This is the first ever book on Ofcom that I'm aware of, and probably the first ever the television discussion about Ofcom and what, what it's all about. Uh, remember that the, the book is available on Amazon. You can buy it there. Now, um, uh, my Jericho is a potpourri. So next week, we've got the, the camp. There's the book. There, there's the details of it on, on Amazon. Next week, next Wednesday, we've got uh, the campaign to pedestrianise Little Clarendon Street in the evenings. Uh, that's at uh, 5.30 next week. We'll, we'll start the ball rolling and whether we should ban traffic from there to allow cafe culture to develop. Uh, uh, as you know, those you regular My Jericho watchers, traffic is a rather big issue in Jericho. And then the week after that, we, we, we've got a, a treat. Bob Dylan is 80 on the 23rd of May. And Professor Gary Browning earlier this year did uh, a lovely program about Bob Dylan 80, which had some actual Dylan songs in it. So uh, please tune in to both of those. And um, we're on each and every Wednesday. And um, just back to the book. Do 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 buy the book, please. It's called What the Point? What's the Point of Ofcom? And it's out now on Amazon. And thank thank all four of you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah!